Okay everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ian Maverick, I'm from Australia. I come to Tandy Assembly every year and I uh, have been associated with TRS-80 computers from uh, pretty much the beginning. So uh, I try to uh, switch things up a bit when I'm doing these talks and make it a, a bit of a history lesson and throw in a little bit of humour at the same time to, to break up the technical talks. So uh, I'm quite jet lagged, I have to say. There was 30 hours of flying to get here yesterday and then about a total of three hours of sleep last night. So if, uh, if some of my humour falls short of the mark, just uh, ignore it and move on to the next one. So our talk today, I've got my assistant, uh, my usual assistant and helper, Eric Dittman here. Hello there. Is your mic working? Hello. Yeah. Yep, good. Um, so, and he's bought... Uh, if you had a look at his table, you've probably seen a whole bunch of what looks like quite uh, um, eclectic collection of uh, oddities there. Uh, these are some of them, so they all form part of this, uh, this talk here, so hopefully uh, it will all make some sense to you. So our talk today is craptastic or just crap. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. So... Um, TRS-80 accessories that fell short of the mark. So uh, a lot of us, or all, uh, that started out with these things, we got the Tandy catalogue and they'd produce, they'd come out every year and they'd have these new accessories which looked fan-bloody-tastic. And you thought, I can't wait to get my hands on one of those and some of them were, were super expensive and, and everything. And, and I, I, I don't know about you guys, but some of them that I bought, I sort of excitedly got them home and started using them and just thought, this thing's junk. <laughs> it, uh, you know, it barely does what it's supposed to do or, or it's, it, it does what it's supposed to do, but it does it badly or whatever. So that's what today's discussion is going to be uh, about. Um, and uh, a lot of people know about the, the CGP printer, which I just wipe with the, the, picture, <laughs> the picture there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So good accessories solve a well-defined problem. Uh, they're easy and consistent to use, they have good ergonomics and they represent reasonable to good value for money. Uh, crappy accessories, uh, they solve a, uh, a non-existent problem or answer a question nobody asked. Um, they're difficult or confusing to use, sometimes unimpressive looking. This looks like it's from the, you know, Second World War. It came with that Model 4 case over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And questionable value for money. Some of this stuff, this guy, was very expensive. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about it when we get to it. So, um, all right, examples of good products. DMP 200 printer, uh, quite well priced, rugged. I still have one, it still works like it's new. It doesn't take up too much space. It's got a nice font. It uses regular tractor paper. You can still buy tractor paper now for them if you, if you want to do that. Uh, Model 3, 48K disc system, well priced, dependable, rugged, as big as it needs to be without being any bigger. Uh, fixes most of the gripes that people had with the Model 1 and it was backwards compatible with the Model 1 so it had a good software base. Color Computer 2 is cheap but just durable compact, expandable, ran all the stuff the Coco One did. Um, that price there, 349 was its introductory price. It actually went down and down to the point where, um, I don't know what I mean, even if you bought it for Christmas and didn't use it, no one really minded because <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, that's why you find, a f find them from time to time in their original boxes in, in low use condition. I rarely see these broken. They just run and run and run. And Paul Schreiber's modem 1B, well priced, is dead easy to use. <laughs> well, yeah, it modulates and demodulates. You know what modem stands for, don't you? That's all it does. <laughs> Only has one switch and two lights. And uh, for a lot of people, that was their first ever modem. Started them off in BBSing and all, all that sort of stuff pre, uh, pre internet. So going back to that uh, list there of, uh, of items that, uh, of, of things that make a, an accessory crappy. Um, we're about to, if I get a drink of water, move on to a list of 
10 things which you'll know a lot of them, if not all of them, and you may have interesting differing opinions on, so if you've got a comment or something like that, put your hands up or we can just wait till the end. The controversial one, black beauty cocoa joysticks, cheaply made. Uh, until you get the hang of them, they're really awkward to use. And uh, the stalks on them, they bend. I find them all the time with bent stalks. In fact, they can, you can bend them so far that the plastic at the, the bottom of the thing breaks. So I, um, there was a television commercial on around the time that the, the Coco came out. And, and uh, I think it was for maybe a Coleco or a in television or something. And it's, it was talking up its controller saying it's not just simple sticks. And I think the ad was talking about the Atari 2600, but when this came out, I said, this is a simple stick. That it, it doesn't get much, much simpler than, than one of these guys. Um, but much as I disliked them, I still went and bought them, because I bought a Cocoa and, and, and found that they were as awkward to use as, as, as you expect. But, um, the, uh, they're around and people, and, and they're easy to find. Now, in defense of them, each one of these things I'm going to put up, I'll have a tr an attempt at a defense of what, uh, of what was good about them, is that they actually are potentiometers and, and do an X and Y axis of a 64 by 64 matrix. So they are actually quite sophisticated just crappily designed. An Atari joystick only has four switches and a button, and, um, but it ergonomically is better and, and more suited to game playing. These are technically better and, um, and, not, uh, and not, for most games, actually harder to use. So there was a market for a while of kind of Atari joystick adapters. But you can produce games that have much more fine control with these black beauty joysticks. So um, I thought there would actually be some today in the auction or something and I can show them to you around. But I think you all pretty know them. Anyone here who's owned a Coco has owned some of these. So. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Yep. Okay. So the next one, moving right along. Oh, they're all marked number one. You notice I've got, a, I've got them all marked as one. There's about ten of them, but they're all one because I didn't want it to do a countdown of what... I didn't want it to turn out to be a countdown from worst to best or best to worst. It's really subject, subjective as to... So they're all going to be number one. Electrostatic and thermal printers. Who owned one of these? Yep, a few of you. Yep. Have you still got it? And when you bought it, did you use it for long before you saved up the money for something better? Yeah. Most of the time. Um, so these consist of the screen printer, the quick printer one, the quick printer two, and I, I grouped in here the Coco's TP10 printer. And there is a TP10 over here for us. And, yeah, in the box still. And it's yellow, so if you, if you buy it, just find, uh, find Bert and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so electrostatic. So these are cheap to buy. They're fast, but the print is very, apart from the TP10, the print on these three is very unreadable. They take an aluminium, an aluminium paper um, and literally burn the... Uh, the image onto it. I'll pass that one around. And good Holy luck shot. finding the paper nowadays. And yeah. Paper is very expensive. So a head, a, a head passes over the aluminium paper, spits out some sparks, which burns a little bit of the aluminium off, to produce, liberating a black carbon type of thing. It was, it was common for the time, but it was, all right, so, None of these are full-size printers. That one, the paper for that is about, what, about four, four inches wide. 
This one's about five inches wide. This is two and a half inches wide on this one. It's, and it's so, it, it's so uh, um, difficult to read. It's not even good for receipts. Uh, the TP10 thermal printer is, is the easiest to read out of, out of all of them. Just don't leave the paper in the sun. Yeah. The quick printers by name were quick compared to what else was around. You could get output quickly. But there are other re really weird limitations, like Quick Printer 2 had a 32 column display, but the computers that are all designed to connect to it have 64 column displays. Um, the screen printer, this bad boy, um, is a weird contraption that you press this button on the front, and it just takes a snapshot of the screen and spits it out on paper. Um, you, can't, you can't list a program to it. Now, if you want to list a program to it, you have to list, pause the thing at 16 lines, press the button, unpause it, get another 16 lines, pause it, press the... You get what I'm, you get what I'm saying here? And imagine you've got a 16K long program or, or something. And they made two generations of this turkey. Um, I was hoping we could see this one running, but I, even Eric hasn't seen it running. We don't know if it will just blow a reefer cap <laughs> capacitor the minute we plug it in. So I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to see it running. Yeah, we'll give it a try. We'll, 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 give it a, we'll give it a try later. Yeah, so all right, in defense of these printers, uh, the screen printer was the only thing that worked with level one. So if you had a level one TRS-80, you may recall they don't have printing commands. So the only way to get hard copy was to hook one of these up and press the button of what you wanted to, 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 uh, to print out. The quick printer one and two were actually quick. They, they compared to other printers that were around in, this came out in 1979 and this one about two years later. And the, uh, the TP-10, that was cheap, it was 99 bucks and it plugs directly into a Coco or an MC-10 and actually doesn't look too bad next to a, to a MC-10. And pointing out earlier where you said, you know, showed that the Model 3 was an improvement over the Model 1 because it fixed a lot of the defi deficiencies and one of them is they added the print commands to level 1 basic for the Model 3 so you could actually use a regular printer. Yeah, there was a, a level 1 Model 3 so it was a, a very rare and collectible computer that's uh, probably would have made this list if I uh, if I'd thought about it because a, a 4k level 1 model 3 is pretty pretty darn useless okay next one number one <laughs> all right the digitizer this thing in the box here um, so that publicity photo they stopped using it for a while because it made it look like it had a it came with a fancy program where you could uh, use your screen to I don't know, do draw, draw stuff. Uh, it, it, yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, you can walk, walk it around while I, while I talk. So it sort of sits on the computer uh, like that, and this big long thing. Can you imagine it, what it looks like on, on top of your Model 3? I mean, it's... Okay. Um, it's an X, it's the, it's a input version of an XY plotter. So they're, so they're probably thinking people who are cartographers and stuff who are ins, con, inscribing maps and things might get, get a use out of it. But that, that's more of a mini computer type application and the, the computers that, that this would connect to via the serial port probably just didn't, didn't have the performance or the, like a lot of these things that I'm going to get to, to uh, soon, Tandy said, we've prov we'll give you this device, but we've got no applications planned for it, and we'll give you the details on, on how to program it, and you guys go knock yourselves out. So that's, that's, that's their way. Yeah, so... stupid, but isn't he scanning information that's already in the computer? Yeah, I know. It looks... Oops. It, it looks almost like a Dow Jones... Uh, thing and 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 he's he's kind of following it uh, I don't know 
it might have been easier to just hit save on the Dow Jones thing and, 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 and don't worry and don't worry about this thing. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is probably, you know, this is the publicity, the, the ad for it. And like a lot of them, what the ad was wasn't really how it was used. Like typically there were no cords running to anything in the ads. And, you know, it was just set up, make it look good, but don't actually show the use of it. Yeah. It's from a time when, um, you see, if this came out now with, the no, with no support, people would be returning them to the company pretty quickly saying, there's no software with it, I can't do anything with it, I'm not a programmer. So when this came out, this, was, this publicity shot from 1982, they, Radio Shack still thought most people who bought them still programmed the computers. But that's, a, that's a sort of the beginning of the era of people buying software and, um, and using it rather than sitting down with the manual, learning to program. and and do it themselves. In defense of it, uh, well it predates a serial mouse and in a way it's a, it's a sort of inverse version of it. It's measuring x and y axes and spits the information through a serial port into the computer. So that um, looks like the proper use of it. Yeah, yeah that's the, the yeah, it, which do, I don't know, I don't know anyone who does that sort of st stuff with it and, and it, it Probably is brilliant for this, but they didn't provide the software to do anything to do that with it anyway. Uh, it is collectible, and when you find them, then they're almost always in the box, and they're almost, I mean, this one that's part making its way around, it looks new and unused, because it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the digitizer. It, it, like that publicity shot and this sort of thing, it, it looked great, but, uh, and um, I don't know if you can read it there, but at 450 bucks, that was not an insignificant amount of money for, uh, for the device. All right, moving on. Eric, buggy <laughs> software. I'm going to let Eric talk about this one for the moment. Yes, uh, CPM Plus, uh, or also CPM 3.0, was released for the Model 4 and the Model 2 12 line. And it was probably released because they wanted to sell into places that use CPM. The problem was the software was so bad that Radio Shack actually refunded anybody's purchase on open software for this if they complained with the exception of MRD, <laughs> they did not take his back. But, and, and there was even a letter, and that's how I found out that they were taken back in 80 Micro where somebody you know, wrote, said, hey, I bought this and it's complete crap. And Radio Shack responded saying, okay, we'll take it back. So everybody started returning it. <laughs> and um, I think that's why it's a little harder to find, is because a lot of people returned it. And, you know, instead of setting it on a shelf, you know, and just saying, well, that was $400 that I wasted. These were not cheap software packages. Superscripts it and, um, and uh, CPM ran into the hundreds of dollars. It's not like you bought a $49 word processor, found it was rubbish. and went and tried a different one. And it didn't even support all the features. It was very limited in what it mm. could do. So if you had like a Model 16 or a Model 12 with double-sided drives, well, guess what? You're using single-sided. Uh, and saying the 4D double-sided wasn't supported. And it did have limited hard drive support, but it only supported the 8 and 5 meg drives. It didn't support the bigger ones. So, you know, it was... It, it just didn't work and it was very slow. My personal experience with it, model uh, CPM plus 3.0 on a model 4, I obtained a copy somehow or other, a, a consignment of stuff I bought or something, put the disk in, booted it, put the date in, and I'm looking at the A prompt and the cursor isn't doing a rhythmic flash, it's, it's doing it. It, it, it. It's like they didn't even get the cursor right, which is a really bad omen for the for the for the operating system. That uh, that, that that this is, is is the only thing in the Model Four that I think it had going for it was that it had it, it supported the 128K Model Four, and I was using CPM 2.2 from from a third party called Montezuma, which was a 64K operating system. But this was another one. I sort of played with it for five minutes, and and then just said this this doesn't make any sense so yeah and it was it was bad enough that you know it, it, using cpm you wanted a large tpa you know transient program area so that you could keep a lot of information in memory 
Well, the unbanked version had a 43K TPA, and the banked version only had a 53K TPA. <laughs> so it was still really limited. Yeah, yeah. What a, what a classic beta programming. Still, no, uh, no collector's shelf would be, uh, would be the same, with, <laughs> would be without them, put it that way. Uh, in defense of buggy, uh, buggy software is pretty much indefendable. I can't think of any way to put a positive spin on buggy software. So just use other stuff. So yeah. uh, Well, I will say that it was so bad that it inspired me to write my own BIOS for GPM <laughs> for the Model 4, which I used and developed and got a lot better use of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He wrote his own BIOS for, the, for, his, for CPM. Um, I used LaScript for years. All right was just as good as LaScript. Never crashed or did any problem whatsoever. And Montezuma CPM 2.2 for the Model 4 is, again, um, just a classic CPM installation that never never fails to, uh, to, to crash out with idiotic errors. Okay, voice technology. These are, these are the, the kind of, for collectors, holy grail of accessories, but they're really junk. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk about the Model 1 Vox Box and voice synthesizer, and I'll throw in there the Coco speech and sound pack. Um, Voice technology, we take it for granted these days, but it had to start somewhere, and then when it started was about this time, and uh, that's when the Votrax chip came along and, the and theories on how to, how to implement voice recognition on a computer um, uh, were developed. So um, the voice synthesizer uses a Votrax chip, which, which is was very robotic sounding at the time, but at the uh, uh, 40 years down the track, it, it's a lot of people can't even recognize it. It, does, it just sounds like someone speaking into a vocoder with the VCO. If you know what a vocoder is, it's a, it's a type of musical yeah, instrument. Yeah, the voice synthesizer used the first rev of the Votrax chipset. So uh, the later ones like used in the VS100 were a lot easier to understand. But this one, combined with the cheap speaker behind the grill, mm. which didn't help, made it harder to understand. Yeah, it's hard to use and hard to program because you have to learn a new program, a programming style called phonics. Where uh, so you can't just tell it to, t you can't just change the print command to a to a speak command and a, and then type hello world. You've got a you've got a pr spell it out phonetically with with vowel type. A, a vowel type language, so that does work, but it's it's very time consuming getting these text messages um, sorted out. The Vox Box is literally a uh, A to D converter that just takes sound and converts it into a, sh a small segment of uh, of memory. And the way that it works is that it compares what you've said at a later point with what it is registered in the memory as. Um, a, a representative sample of whatever it is that you want. Now, it holds, is it 32? I think it's 32. It holds 30, I think it holds 32 it samples. Memory size. Yeah. So you can't speak into it like a word processor. You need to do, you need to store individual letters. And if you think about the alphabet's 26 letters and all the numbers that it gives you, then you're at 36. So you can't even put the whole alphabet and the, and the numbers into, into the storage thing. It stores it in a little bit of, uh, in an area of your 48K memory. And um, so it, uh, it became a, it, it, it was a cool thing to have and, and it did work if, real, if you had really exacting conditions it couldn't remember or save your samples, so every time you went to use the thing, you had to retrain it. You'd load your software, retrain all your samples, and then um, if you got angry at it, it couldn't understand the 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 the, inf the inflection change in your in your voice. It was it was hopeless at that, um, but it was but it, it was cheap. That was about two hundred dollars, but that was dear. That was like double double the price. So. Um, yeah, I think the box box probably inspired a lot of people to just write a manual system. Yeah. I did write a Vox box program that worked once, and um, <laughs> and it was uh, it was for 
what I was interested in, which was science and maths, and so I found that you could actually sample enough stuff to do basic calculus in, you know, and sample things like integrate, differentiate, quadratic, and all, all the numbers and the letters A through A through F and, you know, things like that. But I, I submitted it to, uh, to 80 micro and was, you know, waiting for my check. <laughs> and, and they... And they wrote back and said, this is fascinating, but it's an accessory that not enough people have or know how to use, so we can't print your article. So that, <laughs> that didn't go well. Um, why is this thing not moving? There it goes. OK, there it goes. In defense of the Voxbox, it was collectible, it was cheap, it did work. Uh, Radio Shack warned us. Um, uh, yeah, speech recognition is a new technology. In fact, your Radio Shack Vox Box is one of the first such devices to be both available and affordable to general consumers. For this reason, Radio Shack recommends that the unit primarily be used for entertainment and experimentation. P proceed advisedly uh, before committing uh, the unit to any serious application. Translation, we think it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> But in defense, it let them clear out a lot of their CB mics. Yeah, I did. I, I always suspected that's a CB mic off from from uh, from a, a lot of their CBs that they sold in the 70s. And I said to Yet Yetzko, was this a way of clearing out a lot of mics they had in stock after the CB boom went bust? And he said, pretty much, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, so people had ideas of like, yeah, maybe we could help the disabled with a with a system that's put a Model 1 on a, on a trolley like this with a, a Vox box and a, and a voice synthesizer and some really kick-ass software and they could really be helpful, but it, it was just too early on to be able to, to come up with anything that was, was remotely user-friendly. Uh, the voice synthesizer, it's collectible, it has a, well, I call it an iconic voice, uh, it uh, take, takes a little getting used to. Uh, there's, it did have one so software app that people didn't realise, so the ELISA program that Tandy sold, um, actually on one side of the tape it says ELISA, on the other side of the tape it says talking ELISA, and that means that if you've got a voice synthesizer, it will talk to you. Curiously, it speaks with a male voice, even though th this looks pretty, you know, feminine <laughs> to me. and. Um, and I, 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 what is your problem? I like that. <laughs> it's, you see, it's, what is your problem? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You just bought a voice synthesizer. That's what your, that's what your problem is. Yeah. Uh, the Coco Speech Pack. Uh, it wasn't too expensive. It did a bit better job, and it had some additional features, sound effects, and things like that. Um, it was relatively popular. They sold it for a lot of, for a long time, and I, I think there's a. a a reasonable number of programs out there that that use it and most coco enthusiasts want want one of these things even if they they rarely use it it, it plays the sound out of the tv speaker that's why it hasn't got a, a speaker built into it next uni hammer printers okay who knows what one of those is all right yeah you know all right so it diff it's only got one hammer, <laughs> hence uni hammer. It's like a dot matrix done on the cheap. <laughs> so I'll switch to the next page. And so this technical drawing here, this thing spins around really fast and this hammer bangs it as it turns around behind the paper and makes an impression on the, on the, uh, on the paper. The, the, the Tandy's three Unihammer printers were the Line Printer 7, DMP100, which is an uh, enhanced version of it, which is why they look practically the same, and the DMP110. They allowed Tandy to sell a, um, a full-size paper, tractor paper printer for under 400 bucks, which for the time was a pretty good, a pretty good deal. And you did get, a, you did get legible print. Uh, to come out of the thing, even though it was it was poor quality. So, this is a DMP one hundred. This is a Unihammer printout here. 
And this is the printout from that DMP 200 that I showed you. It was twice the price, but this looks, this is decent. That one is only really good for program listings. You wouldn't want to write a letter to your Congress or something like that and on, on, on that thing. This was only a seven dot, seven pin matrix. These are nine pin. So there's a, there's a seven pin matrix. And they were slow and they have a really strange sound as they're, as they're going. I mean, the, the, the dot matrix printer has an iconic sound. A uni hammer just sounds like paper being shredded. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so again, a lot of you, I bet a lot of you bought one of these guys as your first printer and were probably pretty happy with it um, in that you use regular tractor paper and, and you, got, you got output eventually. It only prints about uh, one line every three seconds or something. It's, it's, it's snail, snail speed. Uh, so yeah, they're still around and last year I think we had three of them in the, in the auction as well. So <laughs> I, I hope that whoever got them, um, got them up and running and then they'll agree with me on all this. Number one, <laughs> the next number one, is the Tandy uh, Coco graphics tablet, the X-Pad. It's, it looks cool. This, this woman here looks like she's doing something serious with it. It, um, it's not that big, but if your desk is, by the time you've got disk drives and printers and a cassette player and joysticks and deluxe joysticks, it's, and it, it has the, uh, the same sort of issues that the, uh, the digitizer has in that it's, it, it looks great, but came with no software and, and re that really left it up to your own uh, imagination as to what to do with it. And it wasn't cheap. Throwing away 350 bucks was, uh, or you could actually get it on credit for 28 bucks a month. But I think after about the, th the th second month, you'd be thinking, boy, wish I <laughs> wish, wish I bought something else. Exactly. <laughs> um, now, the, the, I, I put it, it doesn't work with Coco Max. Coco people here know there's a program that was very popular, um, a, a, a version, uh, it's not a port, but a, a, a program that does on-screen drawing very similar to Mac Paint at the time. And I thought when, Mac, when Coco Max came out that that was a natural for this thing, but all, no one's actually done a, a way to use this thing on Coco Max, and I thought it would be brilliant. But, so that's really just my personal thought. It, uh, if there's one thing that this thing could have excelled at, it would have been used with Coco Max, but not to be. Um, it's collectible. It almost always comes in its box, and, and it's compact when it's stored away, which I'm telling you it will be <laughs> most of the time. You, you won't get much use out of it. And it carried a name, GT116. Graphics tablet, I don't know what the 116. They must have just liked the number. I've yet to work out what it's about. Appliance and light controllers, who had these? Yep, junk? <laughs> yeah, no? Anyone get a serious use for them? All right. So they had two versions of it. That's the first one for the Model 1, 3 and Coco, and that's the second generation Coco only one. Sounds luxurious. You're sitting on your lazy boy, you know, recliner. You get, get, television in front of you and your cocoa next to you and you get, tell it to dim the lights or, I don't know, boil the kettle. You don't have electric kettles in this country, but you, know, you get what I'm saying. Um, you can see the problem though, to operate all the electrical devices that are connected to it. Yeah, Eric's going to bring one around it to figure to have a look at. Um, it ties the computer up for whatever other computer stuff that you want to do. So, say you want to, say, say you want to, say you're in the living room and you're working on a spreadsheet, but it's, you, it's, it, you want to turn the brightness of your lights up, so you have to sp save your spreadsheet, exit out of it, load up the command control center, tell it to turn up the light <laughs> brightness, exit out of the program, go back to your spreadsheet and keep, it, 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 it was, Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's actually what I was, uh, was going to say next. That's very perceptive of you. Radio Shack probably thought, well, this is a way to get, you know, more than one computer in a house and 
we, we want more than that. that. You know, we want that more than anything. So, so what you can see here is that they actually added some manual controls to the second one, so you didn't have to turn off your cocoa every time you wanted to change a, a, a setting in your house or something like that. And um, surprisingly, they were on the on the market for a long time. But uh, I uh, just kind of like I think the idea is good, but the actual uh, number of applications is 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 few, and the operation is awkward. And for collectibles, you can find those, but you don't see the modules that often. So, yeah, it uses a weird system of sending of, of sending RFI system through your home electrical system. Um, Isn't it X10? Yeah, X10. Yeah. X10. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, we don't have X10 back in my country because it's just not a not a thing. So these were never sold in my in my country, but. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but basically it's a, it's a, a big long um, boogaloo about uh, if you can't get it to work. It basically says if you can't get it to work, um, write to the government for this pamphlet and uh, <laughs> don't ask us. <laughs> so easy to use. Uh, in defence of them. Um, might be handy on vacation if you're in an area where uh, where you can tell it to program it to turn the lights on and off at various times to give the impression that people are at home. Your your house is less of a burglary threat or something like that. That's the only thing I can I can think of. But even that, if you had a power outage or something, then it doesn't come back it doesn't come back on as it was as it was left. Uh, second version has manual controls and they they come in the box all the time. Even this one that Eric's showing around. Original box. And, um, yeah. Yeah, the manual there and everything. Mm. All right, can I have a little less competition, guys? Thank you. Got a question? Yeah, I'm just curious. This, this stuff that nobody found it real good use for when it first came out, yeah. how does it become collectible? <laughs> um, it becomes collectible because Radio Shack catalogs came, came out and if you're an enthusiast of the machine you had to be a millionaire in the 80s to buy everything in the catalog. So, you, so what your mind does is earmark it for the future and then when you see it and you have some means behind you and it's cheap enough you're like I'm going to add it to my collection. But collectors here, are not, I'm not talking about users, I'm talking about collectors, they buy it put it on the shelf and, and say, right, that's another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Like, for instance, mine, I forgot I even had bought it. <laughs> so I was getting together the things from my storage unit and I opened a box and I said, oh, wow, I have one of these and I don't even remember ever getting one. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Who here has bought something on eBay and then six months later bought the same thing again because they, oh, I've done it. Because they thought, oh, I need one of them, I've got to get it. And they forgot they bought the first one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a first world problem, isn't it? Yeah, that's a Coco cartridge. So the first one you had to load the, the, um, the uh, control software off cassette, which, uh, which again, if you're hanging out for a, for a cup of tea or coffee and you want it to turn on your coffee, Mr. Coffee, you've got to load the tape and, <laughs> yeah. All right, controversial one, <laughs> the MC10 computer. Where's, where's Brendan Donahue? Yeah. Back there. <laughs> I don't hate them. I'm not saying that. I'm just pointing out some, some facts. The, the fact is they've turned out to be actually a rugged computer that rarely breaks down and, and um, uh, it does the job. It was a cheap limited version of the Coco. It's not software compatible with the assembly language, the, the actual good games on a, on a Coco. Um, it has a tiny amount of RAM unless you put this Hooga Juga on the back which brings it up to 20K, but it's still not much RAM. Most, soft, most hardware doesn't work. Can't plug joysticks, even the black ones. Can't plug disk drives, can't plug... You could plug a modem or a... Uh, or a, um, a um, serial printer into it. Uh, it was, it's small, you can type on it, it's not as bad as a Sinclair or something, but it's, it's still pretty bad to type on. 
As a touch typist, I found it frustrating because it's only got the one shift here. The other one's a control. And so if you're used to using your pinkies to hit shift and things like that. And in the pricing scheme, a 16K Coco One was only 100 bucks more and you could expand that to a full 64K system with enough time and, uh, and, and saving of paper round money. So that's the, uh, so I'm wondering if, the, if, if many people are gonna take it, uh, take it badly that I've put, that I've lumped the MC10 in here, but it's, um, I'm just stating all this stuff is actually true. And of course, if you did buy one, Talk to Brendan. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buy his accessories for him. Yeah. Um, it's compact and cute. It is an actual computer. It actually, it's not a, it's not a toy, you know, it looks like one and, and everything. It's better than its contemporaries. There were a few contemporaries at the time. It was bought in to try and, it was bought out to try to get a computer down as low as 120 bucks. I think it was new. And also um, people at the time that they'd designed this were buying this but by the time this came out these were on you know clearance at 49 bucks or whatever but this is still far better than than the the Sinclair so that's uh, the MC10 and a lot of people was their first computer particularly when Tandy put it on clearance at like 50 bucks or something they just went out the store number one slow pen graphic printers so these use for those who don't know about them they don't use dot matrixes or anything they use quite literally special versions of ballpoint pens to write mechanically on the on the paper so the cgp 115 is the one you will all know it was used on the coco the uh the paper represents a toilet roll it's about in in uh in in size this thing was expensive it's black only I kind of think of this as a, this is a printer plotter. I, I, it has more in common with a, a Houston flatbed plotter that, doesn't ha that, ha that has a platen and it moves the paper that way rather, uh, rather than moving a pen in two dimensions. Um, uh, a lot of people bought these and then quickly stopped using them because they were god awfully slow. and. And you think that the, the, the big pen plotter, hey, you know, at least you can, you know, use it for something, but the paper was narrower than 8.5 by 11 that you could get. So today, good luck finding paper of that width. Yeah, it has very odd paper. It's, it looks like fan fold computer paper uh, with, the, with the holes down the side, tractor paper, but it's like a half an inch and you can't adjust the the sprockets to fit regular paper so pff, what use it is so there's an example of, a, of it printing um, it is a legible print but boy it's slow. To, it's slow to do that if you had to print a term paper or something it would drive you insane and if you printed large chunks of graphics the pen would run out really quick the pens as you can see when it comes past the pens in it are you know, they're less than an inch long. They don't hold much. Um, but for a lot of people, including my main man, Peter Satinsky, that was your first printer, wasn't it? Yeah. How long were you happy with it? Five minutes. Five minutes. How, yeah. how many printer <laughs> listings, program listings did you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, surprisingly, it was in the Radio Shack catalogue for a very long time and went in through two generations, both... Um, both uh, in silver and in, in white. And I was one of the early people that I had one that the wheels, the, the, the gears that Bert was talking about um, cracked. And so I ordered from National Parts at Tandy replacement gears. When they came to my local Tandy store, they said a plastic bag has arrived for you, but there's nothing in it. <laughs> and, uh, and I give me a look and I look at these things like, hey, Bert said, are really freaking tiny. So the new gears arrived, I put them on, started printing it, and then put the printer away. And then when I pulled the, gear, pulled the damn printer out two years later to print something, those new gears had split. So I just, is the, I'm sort of echoing exactly in the last talk what Bert was saying, that they, uh, the, they're too small to be able to last. Um, this is actually the print of the black and white printer. Of the, of the, it's not bad and, but that was a, that was an ex 
this bad boy was an expensive printer. That was like went to like twelve hundred US dollars in nineteen eighty nineteen eighty one. Yeah. Very heavy. And heavy. Very collectible again. All right. Dishonorable mentions is the opposite of honorable mentions. This one's a controversial one again. The original Tandy one thousand and one thousand A. Who bought one? Yeah. What'd you think? You like the A version? But I it mm. Exactly. It was sold too limited to do anything except run Desmate. It came with 128K RAM, one disk drive, no monitor. It has three expansion slots and no serial port. And it's 1200 bucks. So to get this thing to be a usable computer, you had to add a second disk drive, a monitor, a memory expansion card and at the time it was released they were 256k memory cards okay and you got to put two of them in so there's two of your three slots taken up to get it to 640 and then I put in mine a, uh, a serial port because I was into BBSing and things like like that but you cannot f expand the thing further if someone offered me a hard drive it's like well I can reduce the amount of memory and run the hard drive or it was so it uh, it got them into the MS DOS sorry yep I, uh, I bought a third party card for mine and expanded it to 640 plot calendar yes that's correct yeah so oh well, I'll finish the yeah I'll finish the yeah, no, that's okay. So uh, Tandy originally, so Tandy realised, okay, our first generation memory expansion card, 256K, putting two of them in one of these things makes the customers mad because, because there's only one slot left for something else. So about a year later, they, re they released a, a single card which had all 512K on it. So you could, so you then had two slots that you could, you could do stuff with it and they had a plus expander that you could put a serial interface onto the memory card so you then had 640k and two free slots and didn't have to have a, an extra serial board but it was a it was a I don't know kludgy setup and oh and the, uh, the icing on the cake it was slower than an IBM PC there used to be a program called on Norton's suite of things called system information, SI. You typed SI and print out and a big blue screen would come up. It would do some benchmarks of the computer and tell you how fast it was compared to the original IBM PC 5150 of 1981, the first IBM PC. And this guy came in at 0.95 of the percent of the, of 95 per, yeah. 95% of a PC, which was already a slow, outdated computer by the time this came out. Uh, having said that, um, expand it with enough memory, put a hard disk in it, run the, uh, run the apps and things of the time, it did a, it did a pretty good job. So it, uh, it just surprised me when it came out how limited it was and that to make it usable, you, no, one, no one has one of these sitting around at home doing nothing. So not at that time anyway. and, and another thing to remember at the time that these were sold you know there were some third-party expansions available for it that did more but a lot of people radio shack you know if it didn't come from radio shack they didn't know about it and they didn't you know they would have to take and have somebody else install it so they take it to the radio shack store and have them you know install the cards so you yeah. know when you're out in the middle of nowhere the yeah. other. A company that advertised heavily in 80 micro was Zuckerberg, no relation to the Facebook guy, but uh, Zuckerboard, Z U C K, yeah, Zuckerboard, and he produced aftermarket uh, cards for Tandy 1000s, and he had the market cornered for a while because Radio Shacks were over, overpriced and limited, so he, 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 he advertised a lot of things. Uh, another dishonorable mention the DVI. Uh, I say that it's uh, answered to a question nobody an nobody asked because you buy a, ta a Model 100 to be portable and this sort of tethered you to a desk and the only real use I thought, it has a five and a quarter inch uh, disk drive, it's over there, you can see it later, 
but the format is different to any other Tandy. So you can't just save your, your document, pull the disc out, walk over to your Model 4 and do things, which is, seems like the, the only reason to have it. Uh, and they were a shit ton. Like that's American dollars. These were over a grand uh, in my country. And I've never seen one for sale in my country because they sold so few of them. Um, so yeah, disc video interface, overpriced. Yeah, and at the time, you know, like the Model 3 discs and Model 4 discs were really starting to drop heavy in price. So for a little bit more, you could get, you know, a Model 3 or Model 4 disc system that had a program available to transfer your files off the Model 100. Sorry, could you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, by the time you bought a 24K Model 1, a, a, one of these, a monitor, an extra disc drive, it was, uh, it was the same amount, it was actually less to buy a Model 4P or, or Model 4 desktop computer, which had heaps more performance. So it's a, a weird device. Uh, again, when they come up, they, for a while there, they were fetching really big money, but I, I haven't been keeping an eye on, on what, they're, they're worsening, what they're worth these days. Yeah. And right. if, as a collectible, a lot of the ones you find used don't have the cables to connect to the Model 100 or 102. Yes, they're those Tech FB series drives, which the which have very cheap capacitors that like to leak all over the main board. Yep. Uh, controversial. A lot of people love this one. This is the last one. This we're getting to the end of my talk here. Dancing Demon. Uh, who bought it? Yeah, um, <laughs> everybody had it. Just everybody about every. Had it, nobody bought it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is, it's advertised. It says here, games. It's not a game. It's really a demo. And um, there were angry letters written to 80 Micro and other other periodicals. People saying, you know, Radio Shack were uh, were reluctant to give me my refund. This is only 14.95, but it's, I mean. It's 1495 is 1495 and uh, they, they said you know it's not a game there's no playability um, it does contain incredible programming and and the the result that it does while it's doing its demo is quite un quite uncannily sophisticated for the time but it's not a game that you can play or get immersed in so it, it's it's really a demo now some people some people who buy uh, computers off me or people that set up an emulator or whatever, one of the first things they download is this turkey and, <laughs> and, and, pl and play it. But it was, uh, I, I think it's overrated. <laughs> that's, my, that's my opinion of it. Um, but for a while there, every TRS-80 that I traded in came with a copy of this, of this thing and every tape looked pristine. It'd been, it get load, gets loaded once, maybe twice, and then, okay, we'll put it in the file. I haven't done anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the, the song was annoying after a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, so how are we going for time, Peter? we got like five minutes or something? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, anyone want to put their hands up? What was their least favorite hardware, accessory, or software that knew it was crap as soon as you got it home that perhaps weren't on here, or even if they were? Who bought any of this stuff that I've talked about? Um, Blair. I, I remember um, trying to use the original cassette editor assembler with the Model <coughs> 1. Um, I'm sorry, with the Level 1. Oh. The Model 1. And it was such a pain to use because you had to load in uh, a separate cassette in order to run your machine language program. Because Level 1 didn't have the equivalent of a system command. Yeah, and it was yeah. so di uh, difficult to, to, to yep. keep up your assembly language programs on a level one. Level two was a whole different thing. Yeah, they did that to encourage people to upgrade to level two. Anyone else? <laughs> Everything's about making money. So, you know, if they can encourage you to buy another computer to run the appliance control system, then they think that's quite worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and, and it doesn't just apply to it if you bought it new. As a collector, you know, you think, hey, I've always wanted one of these. I get it and set it up 
for me, it was the DVI. I said, oh, wow, you know, I always wanted one of those. I got it set up and thought, back in the closet it goes, you know. Yep, yep. You have I've got a couple, but uh, the Canyon 2000 did make the list. We talked about that. So yeah. You know, my position, when it came out, the Tandy 2000 was a great product. Yeah. But rapidly, 100% IBM compatibility took over, and it went from a great product to a bad product, you know. Yeah. And the Tandy 2000, the performance level of it was higher than a lot of even IBM's products for a, for a few machines. It was, they called it their advanced series and a high performance MS-DOS machine. That was, their that was their advertising slogan for the Tandy 2000. I bought one and it did that. If you had the right software for it, it, was, it wiped the floor with every, other, with every other PC. It was astonishingly expensive to build up a color, to build up a color Tandy 2000 with 768K RAM, a hard disk, Cost more than a 16B with a hard disk, and uh, and, and and so you, you really had to had to want to uh, expand those things. But that's what we we discussed that. But I said the 1000 is more like it because it's more limited, and in in it was meant it was meant to try and get, claw back their MS DOS uh, ball that they dropped, um, and. It did in that it sold really well, but I, I think a lot of people kind of were like, geez, I've got to add a lot of stuff to this thing. So, yeah. yeah. Another one that we discussed that was left off was the Model 1200. Its only sin was it, it was more expensive, but you could get it at Radio Shack. So if that was your only option to get something at Radio Shack, you could get a pure IBM PC compatible. Yeah, at one point they sold all three of them alongside each other, the 2000, the 1000, and the, and the 1200. Um, and the, 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 the 1200, if you just wanted to run one, two, three or word perfect and not mess around with anything else and want a standard keyboard layout and everything, that was the, the one to get. But it wasn't actually, um, it had no input from Tandy whatsoever. It was built by the disk drive company Tandon and just sort of offered to, to, to Tandy and said, do you want to put Tandy badges on it and sell it? And, uh, and, and they just said, yeah, we'll, this will get, we'll move them for you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, you, next. Yeah, I, I was out in the um, Northern California area around 2006, and I bought a box full of parts for TR, a couple TRS-80s. And this was in 2006, so one of the things in the box was an old TRS-80 acoustic coupler. Yeah. Whoa. And I thought, should I try this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked at it and I thought, uh, even back in the day when you need it, I'm guessing it probably wasn't super reliable. Now, this is a funny story. Uh, I had, my first modem was an acoustic coupler because I got it secondhand cheap and I just, all my friends laughed and said, that's going to be completely unreliable and not, and not, worked at, not work at all. I used that for two years and it never dropped, it never dropped one byte. It worked perfectly. As long as those, those cups that hold the, the, the telephone receiver are, are sealing it properly, they actually work surprisingly well. And my, my friend said, uh, you know, who was, who was an unbeliever about how well the, the sound, the cups, these things. We're in my, in my room, now I had a realistic stereo system with Mac 1 speakers, if you know what they are, they're a serious, serious realistic speaker. We had to turn that up to full with heavy metal playing while on a BBS to get it to, to, uh, to, and we're standing here like this, and we finally got it to corrupt one byte. So it, uh, that's, that's my story in defense of acoustic couplers. Well, they now, sold the acoustic couplers for the Model 100 because given the Model 100 you use it traveling around, you were going to a pay phone, so you needed a way to hook up and transmit your hmm. story if you're a reporter, you know, over a public telephone, so you couldn't take it apart to hook up. Yep, yep. As I'll, I'll get to you in a sec. As a um, as as crap accessories go, t Tandy did a. I always wanted to talk to Paul Schreiber. I hope he can come back one year so I can talk to him about the modems. But Tandy always seemed to keep outdated slow modems 
available for purchase years after the world had moved on to faster speeds. Like when I was using a, a, a 2400 board modem, you could still buy a 300 here in the United States and probably everyone used 2400. So you, in the auction over there, there's like some 300 board modems new in the box because what, these are direct connect modems or whatever. So they, they sort of kept them on the, in the catalog and available for purchase for years, but they, they just uh, were so, they outdated themselves modems for a while there so quickly. 300 to 1200 board took like five years, but 1200 to 2400 board took two years, and then another year later we're at 9600 board. So, anyway, I'm off on a tangent. You had a question for me? Yeah, just uh, thank you for taking me the equivalent of a Radio Shack Vietnam flashback. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at Radio Shack, but a lot of the stuff was being sold, and you know what it was like trying to sell crap? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put a straight face. <laughs> What about video, those video text terminals? I don't think I ever sold one of those ever. The cocoa shaped ones? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they, uh, I, they never sold those in Australia, but they were in the, uh, the US catalog from uh, 1980 up until well into the Coco 2 era. They must have just had an inventory of them that would never move. And so they, they had them for ages. They do occasionally show up on eBay and we had a really great display of them here. Uh, back in 2018 or 19, yeah, something like that, yeah, something like that. Boise, the video, the video text. text uh, we had the green thumb and all those different ones. What year was that? Uh, the video text thing came out in 1980. No, not that. Which Tandy assembly did we have them all here? 19, maybe. Yeah. They, uh, they, they, um, they were interesting and, and went through a, a really interesting development. Through and this, green the, thumb and this everything. presentation was crap you bought, and if nobody ever bought the video text, it wouldn't <laughs> <be>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any last questions, or I'll wind this thing up. Yep, Armadeep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, if Paul was here, he would tell you that he got an official warning from uh, from um, from the higher ups that the uh, that that they can't sell it as a modem because 600 board only worked if they were connected to each other directly, not through a phone line. So, so he uh, so he got quickly told don't include features that uh, that don't work properly. Um, so I'm going to finish this up with just saying the last thing that I just sprung to mind is Tandy Furniture is cheaply made, overpriced, and uh, probably definitely fits into the, into the crap category. Some of those desks, like the Model 1 and Model 2 desk these days, they're, they're bowed like a the boomerang. Model, and the Model 2 <laughs> desk is okay, but the Model 1 desk, I dare you to find one that's not bowed. Yeah. They're not bowed. They're not bowed. We, we, yeah, because wow. they're still Did in the box or whenever you on them? That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thanks, guys. <laughs>